Good morning, Redeemer. Um, as I'm sure you guys were all tuned in this uh, past week with the elections, and uh, I'm sure um, perhaps some of you guys are excited about the opportunity with the new uh, president-elect, but at the same time, some of you may be anxious and worried about uh, what the future may hold. Uh, it seems that our country is as divided as ever, and I'm sure there's a lot of anxiety that comes with this um, present uh, circumstances. But I hope and pray that through our worship today, especially as we are reminded of God's, not only his presence, but his sovereignty and his control over not only our lives, but the entire world. Um, hopefully you could find strength and comfort in knowing that God is still in control, uh, no matter what, what our uh, circumstances may otherwise uh, suggest. Uh, so with that thought, um, let's all rise and hear God's call to worship that comes from Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. And this is a wonderful reminder that our high priest, he knows us. Uh, he knows all our fears. He knows our anxiety. Uh, he knows what we go through. And he sympathizes with us, and he seeks to minister to us. So may our, our Savior, may our Redeemer, may our great, great high priest uh, minister to us today as we worship him. So here is now uh, his call to worship. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Uh, can we meditate upon those comforting words and <coughs> prepare our hearts as we come before God to worship Him? Let's pray together. are truly in time of need. The chaos that we find in our lives and in our hearts is but a small picture of the rest of the country and the world. We need your grace more than ever. We need your mercy. We need your truth. We need your wisdom. And we need your peace. And Lord, you teach us that all these are found in Christ and Him crucified. So even as we fulfill our civic duties, help us to remember our calling to be salt and light of the gospel in this broken and dark world. So as you bless us and encourage us today, may we be transformed and renewed in order that we may faithfully proclaim your holy name each and every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Redeemer from where you at, would you rise to your feet as we worship? I pray that you find great comfort in knowing that our Lord is sovereign, that he is, con he is in control, and that he holds us in his hands. So as we sing and we remind ourselves of that truth, would you join in as we sing, I have a maker. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in His hands. Cause He knows. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. Yeah, he sees each tear that falls. He hears me when I call. Sing, I have. As I have a father 
He calls me His own He'll never leave me No matter where I go He knows my name He knows my every thought He sees each tear that falls He hears me when I call He knows my name He knows my every thought He sees each tear that falls he hears me when I call He hears me when I call He hears me when I call It's Jesus we thank you that you are in control, Lord, that you hold us in the palm of your hands, that you walk with us, Lord, and that nothing is unseen, that you reign sovereign over every leader, Lord, that you are king above kings, Lord, above all that we get to worship you. Would you give us comfort and faith in knowing that our hope is found in you and you alone? Would you be glorified and magnified today in today's worship? Let's sing Christ alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh Fullness of God in hell, bliss, babe. This gift of love in righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain Then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first day to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hands 
till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand seated at this time and um, as we continue in our worship um, we'll be going through um, the Heidelberg Catechism today and we'll look at question number 26 and as we uh, think about this theme of God's sovereignty and his rule over our lives uh, may this confession of faith comfort you and strengthen you um, as we look at uh, this wonderful question and answer found on Heidelberg Catechism. Question number six, uh, 26 reads, and I'll read the question as we always do. Uh, please respond by reading the answer in unison. Question 26 asks, What do you believe when you say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules by them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ the Son. Trust in him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for my body and soul, and he will return my good whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is Almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful Father. Um, this is much uh, needed reminder, isn't it? That God has not only created all things, but he also upholds and rules over everything. Uh, especially as we realize how really fragile, how unstable, how broken this really, uh, world really is. Uh, we need to be reminded of that fact that God is indeed in control. Uh, so as we now continue in our worship, um, let's sing this wonderful hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Uh, we'll sing the first two verses. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing Of him who died for thee And hail him as thy matchless king Through all eternity Crown him the Lord of love Behold his hands and side Rich wounds yet visible above In beauty glorified No angel in the sky Can fully bear that sight But downward bends his burning eye At mystery so bright Amen as we now come in our time of worship, uh, worship where we have an opportunity to uh, reflect and confess our sins, um, this past elections reminded me this past week how rampant uh, hypocrisy is in our politics. Uh, the very wrongs that one party would accuse the other party of doing are the very things that they seem to do themselves when things are convenient uh, for them. Uh, but of course, what we find in our politics is but a reflection of our own hearts, isn't it? We're quick to point out the wrongs in others. Uh, we're really good at magnifying the sins of others, but we're also very good at minimizing our own. Uh, pride, self-righteousness, and thus hypocrisy is often rampant in our own lives and our own hearts. It is for that reason Jesus taught us to take out the log of our own eye first. For it is when we do that, when we first come to grips with the depth of our sins, but also the glory of God's grace, then, only then, can we humbly and also gently and lovingly and peacefully 
seek to remove the speck found in others. So as we uh, spend a moment now, as we do every week, uh, may the Lord convict us and also make us humble for the sake of his glory. Uh, Let's pray together. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So dear beloved, let us then rejoice in God's undying love for us and his son and find assurance and peace, knowing that all of our sins, not some, but all of our sins, are washed away by the blood of our Savior and Lord. Amen. Can we all rise at this time and and respond to God's wonderful grace in His Son uh, with our offerings as we sing the doxology together? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Lord, we bring up our offerings before you today, recognizing and and confessing that you are Lord over our lives. We have what we have, and we are what we are, only by your grace and your mercy and your providence. So continue to cultivate in us a heart of humility and thus genuine and deep gratitude. And so, Lord, as we entrust our lives into your hands, we also trust that you will continue to lead and guide our nation. It seems that our communities, our nation, are as fractured and divided as ever. So bring healing and reconciliation and unity. May selflessness and not selfishness rule over all of our hearts. So to that end, uh, we pray that your children, your church, would exemplify peace and compassion, that we will seek the good of our neighbors first, that we will be kind. And as we strive to imitate our Savior in this way, may his name be lifted up and be proclaimed. So we pray for our missionaries, missionaries as they proclaim your word in Japan and Cambodia. Lord, in their kindness, may they speak into the lives of those that are hurting. May their humility speak into the lives of those that are proud before you. May their grace and mercy speak into the lives of those that are in need of your forgiveness. So grant them everything that they need in order that they may fulfill their calling. So strengthen their marriage. Help them to be understanding and compassionate parents and keep them above reproach so that their message may not be hindered in any way. And help us to continue to pray and support them. And as we do so, may we always be reminded of our own calling to be witnesses of your amazing grace in Jesus. So Lord, as we do so, as we strive to live out our uh, wonderful salvation that you have accomplished for us, Lord, as we participate in Operation Christmas Child and Children's Hunger Fund, while these are simple boxes filled with earthly goods, Lord, we pray that as we prepare them, uh, may your love and gospel be proclaimed through these boxes. Help the local pastors and church members who are actually passing out these boxes, that they, uh, their hands and arms would be the very instruments of extending your mercy and grace to those that are hurting. May these boxes bring relief in their time of need, but also fill their hearts with joy in the gospel. 
So as we now listen to your word, Lord, would you feed our souls. Spirit, teach us and sanctify us and bless us and transform and renew us. So empower your servant now to faithfully and boldly declare your word for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I pray that all of you are doing well. And I know that today's freezing, by the way. It is really windy out here. It's been kind of nuts. But hey, I almost feel like fall is finally here. But I pray that, that the Lord will continue to guide you and comfort you as we continue to go through this pandemic. Um, I know that there's been much said about this week, about the election, but I always remind myself that we're still going through a difficult time. And I pray that you would find rest and comfort knowing that God is the one who is our refuge, our strength, and our very present help in a time of need indeed. But this morning, I, that's what I kind of wanted to focus on, the idea of where do we find our comfort? Where do we find our refuge? And that's why today I have to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 46. Psalm 46. <clears throat> and I pray that this would be an encouragement and a comfort to all of you. And I pray that whenever you go through a time of struggle, that you will always come back to Psalm 46, and that it would always speak to your hearts indeed. For this is the reading of God's holy and precious word. May you pay close attention to it. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad <clears throat> the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, their kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Recently, I had dinner uh, with my family, and it's always a very entertaining time in our household, right? My kids eat like animals, and we always have these funny conversations that go on. But this one time, a couple of weeks ago, I really had a bad canker sore. Uh, I bit my lip, and I got this canker sore on top, and so it was really annoying. And you know how it is. It's very painful when you have a canker sore, um, indeed. And so... I was complaining about my canker sore, and I think my kids got tired of it, right? So Seller turned to me and said, Dad, do you need a straw? And I said, no, my mouth is killing me. How am I going to use a straw? And then she said, suck it up. Right? And I was like, oh, my. That's my family for you, right? Dad, do you need a straw? Suck it up, right? In other words, just endure your pain, all right? We don't need to hear about your pain. Just suck it up, Dad, right? I was like, I get no encouragement. I get no love. I get no sense of peace from my own family, you know? And I thought, you know what? I'm tired of sucking it up, right? And I feel like as we're going through this pandemic, it, that's all we hear is just suck it up. And this week has been especially emotional uh, and draining for me as I've watched the chaos of our election unravel before my eyes. Um, it, it, it has a big effect and has a big um, issue in my life because obviously as a school board member, there are decisions that we have to make regarding our schools as well as we have a big meeting tomorrow. And it created so much anxiety because I felt like there was nothing for us to stand on as a nation. Our nation was so divided, our nation was falling apart. I saw so much division, and I just pray, God, let there be peace. I was hoping for a drastic one way or the other, not 50-50, because it reminded me that we are truly a divided nation. But not only that, it's the bad fact that we had to deal with this election on top of this pandemic, where our lives are literally turned upside down. You know, for me, every day I watch the numbers because I have to. And every day it seems like our numbers are getting worse and worse, especially lately. And it seems like because of this, we'll never get out of this pandemic. We had all these restrictions in place, 
and we're hoping to get our numbers down, but they never got there. And now that we are starting to open up more, I'm wondering, will we ever get there? And it causes more anxiety. It causes more fear in my life. And especially when I see my kids, you know, my kids are resilient and they've been doing so great during this pandemic, but it takes a toll after a while. As I see Ian hating and being frustrated with school online, he feels like school is so stupid now. Why? Because everything is online. And everything feels unstable and everything feels uncertain and everything feels so overwhelming. And perhaps this morning you know how this feels. Perhaps this is a reality in your own life. You feel, find yourself filled with fear, fear of the future, fear of our children getting behind in school, fear of getting COVID, fear of our parents passing away. And as we're living with all this fear, then the question I ask you is, where do you find your refuge? Where do you find your strength? Where do you find your help in your time of need? You see, this is what Psalm 46 answers for us. This is why I feel like it is so timely for us as well. For the psalmist knows and understands our fears. For the psalmist himself is also asking these questions and dealing with these questions. But he tells us where he finds his refuge in the very first verse. God is my refuge, my strength, my very present help in a time of need. He's not saying that God is the one who will give us refuge, that God will give, give us the strength, or that God will give us the help. But he's saying that God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our very help in time of need. And that's why today, is God your refuge? Is he your strength? Is your very present help? If not, then where do you turn? But perhaps many of us are afraid and overwhelmed because we have turned to other things and people to be our refuge and strength, and yet they don't provide the security or the comfort that we long for. And that's why this morning, as we go through the psalm, I want us to look at three things. We want to look at our fear. We want to see that God is our fortress. And then finally, we see how do we find refuge. Our fear, God our refuge, and finding refuge. So let's begin by looking at, first of all, our fears. The psalmist begins by saying, therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way. He says, because God is our refuge and our strength and our very present help, he says that we will not fear. That you and I are able to live a fearless life. But there are things in our life that cause us fear. And in our life, these fears can be good or bad. There are some fears that God has given us to protect us, right? For example, fear of fire. In other words, if we didn't have that fear, we can walk closer to a fire and get burned. But he gives us the fear of fire so that we will be able to protect ourselves so that we will not be burned. That's a natural fear. That's a good fear. But there are bad fears as well. Fears that we are not to have. Fears that over, ultimately overwhelm us and ultimately paralyze us. The fear of our security, the fear of the unknown, the fear of our future. And so often these fears are there because of the fact that we feel like we want to have control. So often I feel like our fears are there because we put our trust in the wrong places. Ultimately, we put our trust in ourselves. And when that trust begins to erode, our fear begins to rise. Right? That's what happens. And so often I feel like the fears that we have, our future, or the unknown, or whatever may happen, is because of the fact that we feel like we are not in control. And here we see that the psalmist gives us some examples of these fears that, are, or, that ultimately overwhelm us or perhaps paralyze us. He says that what? The earth gives way. The mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. In other words, he gives us these natural catastrophes, right? The earth shakes, right? The waters foam, right? The mountains tremble at its swelling. And usually these three catastrophes I can perhaps categorize as earthquakes, mountains move, I mean, earth shakes, right? And then you have the waters form, hurricanes, tsunamis, right? The mountains swell at its, mountains are swell, tremble at a swelling, volcanoes, eruptions. These are natural catastrophes. And we know what it feels like. We live in California. We know what it's like when our earth shakes, right? We have earthquakes. And for some of you, you know what it looks like when waters roar or foam because maybe you've grown up in areas where there are hurricanes, right? Where you experience these devastating hurricanes when they come and just flood the whole area wherever it may be. 
Now, we see mountains tremble at a swelling during volcanic eruptions, right? We see Hawaii. We see what happened when the lava begins to flow down. Everything in its path is ultimately destroys or destroyed. And these are not simply natural disasters, but they're absolute catastrophes. But the reason why they cause us so much fear is because we have no control over them. And they provide and they, they give complete destruction and they destroy whatever is in its path. We don't know when they're coming. And there is no way on earth that you and I are able to stop it. And because we cannot stop it, we feel ultimately helpless and hopeless. And that's why we fear. It feels like our world is, in these moments, it feels like the world is falling apart and all hell is about to break loose. And whatever we thought we had refuge, whatever we think we're safe in, when these things happen, you don't feel so. Our refuge gets destroyed. Our security is unraveled, right? You see, you can live in a nice house, but if there's an earthquake, your house may be destroyed. You may not have a nice little hut on an island, but when the volcano comes, your house is destroyed. And when you see these hurricanes, same things happen as well. That's why I always wonder, why do people live in these areas, right, where there's hurricanes, you know? You're just risking your life. But we do. And at those moments, we feel so unstable and insecure. And perhaps we understand this. Because we're living in a time where there's a pandemic of an invisible virus that has turned our, upside, our world upside down. We walk around with massive social distancing because we cannot stop this thing. There is no solution. We can only prevent, but we cannot solve. And it's turned the world upside down. Our numbers are exploding like crazy. And we feel so helpless and hopeless at a time like this. We could have never imagined these things to happen. We feel that our life is at stake every time we go out to eat, or we go out to work, or spend time with our family. Right? We see that fear. We're afraid what the future holds because of this pandemic. We're not sure if we're going to get through this economically. We're not. We're going to make it financially. We wonder how our kids are going to be, how their school, schooling is going to look like in the future. Will there be college for them in the future? We are afraid that the life that we had is now forever gone. And it seems like the world has been crushing down upon us. And everything that we thought was secure and safe is no longer secure and safe anymore. We are not in control. And that's why we feel helpless and hopeless. But these things are so huge in, in, in size and magnitude that what can you do to stop these things? How are you going to stop an earthquake? How are you going to stop a volcano of Russia? How are you going to stop a hurricane? You cannot. You can only hope that the things you put in place will save your life. But so often, these things do not hold up. But it doesn't have to be those things that are fully that big and that magnitude. But there are things that are also cl uh, hit closer at home, and especially for the nation of Israel. This really was very close at home, right? Wars and conflict, right? Verse, look at verse 6. The nations raised, the kingdom totters. He utters his voice. The earth melts, right? For them, for the people of Israel, conflict was a natural part of their life because they were surrounded by their enemies, Right? War was a definitely reality in their life, right? There was going to be conflict. There was going to be harm. And that's why they were always being afraid of being conquered by another nation and being taken captive, right? In the same way, the psalmist feels like his enemies are all around him, ready to conquer him. And as a result, they felt like their existence was always threatened. And it's true, right? They live with conflict every single day. And obviously that creates a tremendous amount of fear. What will my life look like? Can my family be safe, right? This is not something where it's na nature bound like the first example. But this is where man is the problem, right? And these are things that we feel like we can't avoid if we put things in place, right? If we have our armies, if we have our soldiers, we have our fortresses, whatever it may be. But this is something that's more close to reality for them. This is something they experience every single day of their life. And as a result, it created a tremendous sense of fear. Fear for their life, fear for their safety, fear for their security. It was an issue for them every single day. And perhaps we understand that fear as well. For so many people, they were so afraid of this election, of what would may happen if one president got elected over another, right? They felt like the world that they known or what they knew about life will be threatened by, by whoever gets elected. And that was a conflict for them. 
they felt like this was, that this was an attack to them. People take their personal, the political party so personally, they felt like whoever won would have been an attack on their idea of life, their idea of what America ought to be. But for many of us, we also feel like our life is a war zone because of all the conflict that's around us, right? We feel like we're being attacked all the time by people and the society around us. You're not good enough. Why are you like that, Right? Why you're not wearing a mask? Why are you wearing a mask? Right? We always feel like we're being attacked. We feel like there's conflict around us wherever we go. It's almost to the point, like I said last week, we can't even post anything on social media nowadays because we're so afraid of what people will say about us. Right? We're, we're scared of our image. We're scared of our identity. Because we feel like we're being, comf- we're being attacked all the time. And we cannot express our, meaning, our opinions freely or speak the truth without being attacked. And we feel like this conflict is real. We feel like we are in a war zone, right, where we're being attacked every single day of our lives. And we see these fears. And perhaps today, maybe this morning, you do have a fear in your life. What are you afraid of? What is crippling you? What is keeping you from sleeping? Where are those things in your life where you feel like your world is falling apart? What are the conflicts that you are so afraid of? then how do you deal with these issues? How do you deal with your fears? How do you deal with your trouble? Well, the psalmist says, the second point is, that God is my refuge, strength, and help. He's not just a refuge where we find shelter. But verse 11 tells us that he is our fortress. As a matter of fact, he says this twice in verse 7 and in verse 11, that he is our fortress. When God says that he is our refuge, what do you picture? When you picture the idea that God is my refuge, well, the psalmist is telling us what he wants us to picture. He wants us to picture that God is our fortress. He's not just some house that we live in. He's not some place that we just find some rinky-dinky house where we find refuge. No, he wants you to know that this refuge is a fortress where it's high and it's inaccessible, where it is strong and impenetrable. That even though the enemy is surround and attack, That there is no way on earth they're going to get into this fortress. That no matter what calamities may come, no matter how big they are, they may be natural catastrophes, they will not break through this fortress. You can't even begin to imagine. Bring down the lava. Bring down, may the earth shake. Bring down the hurricane. You know what? It will not move this refuge because it is a fortress. Strong, impenetrable, inaccessible in every way. You see, that is the nature of our refuge. You see, unlike the earth that might give way or the mountain that may be moved into the heart of the sea, this fortress cannot be moved. Understand, he's giving us things that should not move. Mountains, right? Earth, these things should not move, but they can shake. But this fortress is even that much stronger than nature itself because it will never be moved. You see, once you're in this fortress, you will not be shaken. This is why the psalmist says that she shall not fear. That when you are in this fortress, you are so secure that no matter what may come, no matter what conflict may come, no matter how your enemies may attack, you are secure. Because why? Because he says in verse 5, the city will not be moved because God is in our midst. Because God is the one who is in our midst. He is the reason why you and I remain so strong. But so often when these troubles and trials come, when these catastrophes and conflicts bring, come about us, we forget that God is in our midst. We fix our eyes on the storm. We fix our eyes on the catastrophe and the conflict. That we forget the one who is with us is greater than the one who is in the world. Right, just like Peter, when he was walking on the waters, right, what did he see? He sees Christ, but from that very moment, he takes his eyes off of Christ, forgetting who was in the other side of the boat. He sees the waves and begins to fear. And when he begins to take his eyes off of Jesus and fix his eyes on the waves and the turmoil, he begins to sink. And what does he do? What does Jesus do? He grabs him and saves him. And we do that the same way with our fears. 
We see our circumstances. We see the things that are going around. But we forget and we don't see the one who is in our midst because he is in our midst that he is our fortress indeed. That's why the psalmist says that he is a very present help. He can help us in the very present. Why? Because he is in our midst. That when we need him the most, he's right there to secure us, to strengthen us, and to watch over us. And who is the one who is in our midst? He is the Lord of hosts. And I love this. The Lord God Almighty. He's reminding us, understand the one that is in your midst. He says this twice. He is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts. Understand what that means, that he has access to armies, the angels, the spiritual realm. That he's got access to all of these things because he is the Lord of hosts. That any moment he can dispose these armies at his will to fight off against all of our enemies. Then what do we have to fear? He is our fortress indeed. That not only does he defend us, but he fights for us. Because he is the Lord of hosts. The one who is in our midst. This is why we will not be moved. Because he's able to dispense these armies to protect you and me indeed. But it's not only that he's our fortune that he provides, he protects, but he also provides. He says in verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 4, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. There are those who argue that this city of God, this holy habitation, is the city of Jerusalem. But it's not. Because there's no river that goes to the city of Jerusalem. But what this is talking about is the very people of God indeed. Because you see, understand, within these fortresses, there are these cities. These fortresses are created to protect the cities in the fortress or the people that are in the fortresses. And so often these fortresses were built next to rivers. And understand why. Because you see, whenever there was a siege against a fortress, because these things were so impenetrable, it will take a very long time. And so because the enemies were trying to break in, you are not able to go out. And if you're not able to go out, but you're going to need resources, you're going to need water, you're going to need food. right? And so because these battles would take so long, they would build these fortresses next to rivers so that whenever there was an attack, they would always have the stream of water so that they can draw from and be refreshed and renewed and be saved. What he's telling us here is that here there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Why? Because God is the one who provides this river, uh, this river, uh, these streams. Right? This is what God provides for you and for me. He, ne- he provides what we need in order to endure. This is why the city of God could be glad. Because we need this water in order for us to be saved. When he is our fortress, it's not that simply he protects us, but he provides our needs. That we don't have to fear. We don't have to be afraid when these trials and tribulations come. When we feel like we don't have any resources. This is why we can be strength. That he is our strength. Right? And that's what we need ultimately from him. But understand, this fortress is useless unless we enter into the fortress. For if we're out of the fortress, then we have no protection or provision. If you're not in this fortress and you think you can build your own refuge, what is your refuge going to look like? Right? Maybe Daniel's refuge, Pastor Daniel's refuge would be better than my refuge because he's a better handyman than I am. Mine would be like unstable, unsafe for sure. I wouldn't want to live in my refuge if I were you. But yet God is the one who builds this one. That's why, dear friends, when we are fearful, fearful and afraid, it perhaps shows us areas in our lives that we have failed to take our refuge in him. Then how do we find our refuge in him? The psalmist tells us three things, and I'm going to go over these quickly. He tells us, behold, be still, and know. Behold, be still, and and know. Then if this is the refuge, this is the fortress, then how do I enter? How do I get that refuge? He says, behold, be still, and know. First of all, he says, behold. 
He says, come behold the works of the Lord, in verse 8. How he has brought his desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. In other words, he's telling us to remember who is in our midst. It is God, the Lord of hosts. He calls us to behold the works of the Lord. He says, look, right? Let it capture your heart. Behold the works of the Lord. That even though the nations may rage, that he is the one who is still sovereign. He is the one who is in control. Remember, all God needs to do is speak and the earth melts. Remember, who is the one who created the world? God did. And how did God create? By the power of his word. He said, let there be and there was. Nothing in this world would have come into existence unless God spoke it into existence. And therefore, don't you think that when the mountains are going into the sea, when the mountains are trembling because it's coming swelling, when the waters and rivers are foaming, right? Don't you think God can speak and put these things down into their place again? That's exactly what Jesus did to show that he was Lord over creation. He spoke into the waters and they were stilled, right? Remember the works of the Lord. He is the one who is the creator. This is why when natural catastrophes are happening, you don't have to be afraid because God is the one who is the Lord of creation and he's able to bring back things the right way that they need to be if he wants to. You see, this is the one that we have to behold the works of the Lord. But it's not only in terms of creation, but we also know that he's able to do with our conflict. Just because, we, just because things seem out of our control, it does not mean that he is not in control. So often when things, we feel like things are out of control, we feel like things are out of our control. But they're not out of his control. And that's why he says God will help her when morning dawns. God will help her when morning dawns. Now understand, what does that mean? This expression, when morning dawns, is from God's deliverance of Israel from the Egyptians and the crossing of the Red Sea. Right? When the morning dawns. Right? Remember what it says in Exodus 14, verse 27. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. In other words, when the morning dawned, the threat was removed. Right? When the morning dawned, the Egyptians were crushed by the Red Sea in the crossing of the Red Sea. Israel was saved, but the threat was destroyed. This is the work of the Lord. This is the one who has brought about the deliverance. When Israel felt helpless and hopeless and lost as the Egyptians were coming down on them with their chariots and with their spears and with their bows, it was God who delivered them by crushing them in the Red Sea. When the morning dawned. And so often you see this idea of on the morning dawn when God saved the nation of Israel by destroying their enemies. This is the one who was in our midst. Remember the works of the Lord. And we've seen the greatest work of the Lord through his son Jesus Christ. Who was defeated the great and last enemy, sin and death and Satan. For there at the cross when it seemed like all hope was gone. When it seemed like Jesus had failed as the Messiah, because there he was, nailed to a cross. And it was dark, and it was hopeless, but that would not be the end of the story. Because you see, three days later, when the morning dawned, and the woman went to the tomb, and what did they find? They found an empty tomb. Why? For Christ has risen from the dead. And he defeated Satan. He defeated sin. He defeated death once and for all. And he is the victor. He is the Lord God Almighty. Remember the works of the Lord. Behold the work of the Lord. And if our Savior has conquered sin and death once and for all, the greatest work of all, then what do we have to be afraid of, my dear friends? That even though our life is taken away from us, even though everything is removed from our lives, one thing that will never be taken away is our full assurance of salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord. He is our fortress. Behold the works of the Lord. 
Know that he can bring life out of death. He can bring victory out of defeat. He can bring light out of darkness. And that is why in those moments when you have so much fear, preach the gospel to yourself. Remember the works of the Lord. Let the work, work of the Lord begin to move you and give you that security. This is how you find refuge. To preach the gospel to yourself and to tell you what God has done and he will do it again. That God is good and he is able and he will deliver us and he is still working. For one day there will be no more conflict, no more pain, no more catastrophes for we will be set free indeed. But it's not only to remember, behold the works of the Lord. Second, he says what? Be still. Be still. It doesn't mean just to sit there and do nothing. That, 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 I think we have the idea just to sit there and do nothing. No, the idea of the be still here is Robert Alter talks about his commentary is to means to let go. Just like a warrior who unclutches his fist, this is what he says, unclutches his fist and lets go of his weapon. This is what it means for us to be still. The idea here, I think, is that God is telling us, stop building your own refuge. Stop building your own refuge. Stop building your own fortress. Let me build it. So often, we don't find refuge in God. We're so busy building our own refuge. We're putting up walls to protect ourselves so that we can avoid conflict and disappointment. We put our security and money and power in people. And the reason why is because we can't be still. It's so hard for us to be still. To trust God that God is the one who's going to protect us. And so what do we do? We try to build our own things, our own refuge. We put our hope and trust in other people and things and money because somehow we think that if we do this, then we'll give us a security that we want. But how is, how is that going to stop a natural catastrophe? How is that going to stop an earthquake? How is that going to stop a tsunami? How is that going to stop a volcano eruption? It cannot. And he's telling us, when he tells us to be still, he's saying, stop trying so hard. Let me be your refuge. So often we create our own strategies to deal with these catastrophes and these conflicts. And so often they work. Don't get me wrong here. So often they work to a certain degree. But the problem is when they're working, we begin to trust it more and more. And when we trust this more and more, we don't, start, we don't trust God anymore. But after a while, these strategies and these walls fall down. And you will find yourself to be exposed and afraid and naked. And eventually you will see the weaknesses of these self-defenses. Now again, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that we don't plan and act properly. We should. But at the same time, it does not mean we put our hope and trust in our plans and the things that we have built. We still put our trust in God and Him alone. Our walls and the things that we build will never suffice. It will never be strong enough. Because here's the thing. If you're building your own refuge, guess what? You're not in his refuge. You can't be in two buildings at one time. I'm sorry to say you may think you can, but you cannot. Either you're in your refuge or you're in his refuge. And this is why when he tells us to be still, he's telling us to enter. This is why we don't find our refuge in him. Because we're so busy building our own. Be still, he says. That's the hardest thing for me to do. I'm not a guy who can often be, be still. But it's humbling. Because when we're still, we're putting our trust in him. We're putting our faith in him. We're acknowledging that God, that you are alone, are our refuge, our strength, our very present help in a time of need. See, not only are we to behold the works of the Lord, but we're to be still. But it's not only that we are still. He finally tells us the third thing, to know that he is God. This is where the trust factor comes in again. You see, we do these things because we forget that he is God. And instead, we exalt ourselves or we exalt other people and things because we put our hope and trust in them. But you see, dear friends, that's what idolatry is. Right? When we make a good thing, the ultimate thing. And that's why these things will fail us. But know that he is God. Know that he is the one who is God Almighty. For he says, he will be exalted in the nations. He will be exalted on 
the earth. In other words, the psalmist is telling us who this God is, that God is the one who is sovereign. He is the one who is the Lord of all, and that he will be exalted. For we know that he will be exalted because he did what we failed to do. He lived the life that we should have lived and paid a debt that we should have paid. And it was the cross that Christ defeated sin and Satan once and for all. And we know that's the future projection. That he is the one who will be exalted. And because he is be exalted, guess what? We will be exalted with him. He's telling us that no matter what you're going through, that is not the end of your story. Remember who God is. God is the one who is exalted. He is the one who is seated on the throne. And what does he say? That I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. This is where the projection of our history is going. That if this world falls away, if our life is destroyed, it cannot take away the future glory that we have in him. This is why he's our ultimate security and hope. For in that day, he will make desolations on the earth, and he will be exalted. And that's why, what do we see in Revelation chapter 22? What do we see at the very end of scripture? It reminds us what is waiting for us. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no lamp, no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Don't you see in Revelation 22, we see the picture of the new Jerusalem, Why? And what do we find there? We find the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God. Because you see in that day, God will be exalted and all things will be made right. We see the beauty of the new creation. And that is our ultimate hope. That is ultimate our security. And that's what he tells us. Not only are we still, but know that he is God. He is the Lord Almighty. He is working through our fears. He's working through our catastrophe. He's working through our conflicts. And one day we shall rule and reign with him for all eternity, my friends. This is why. Do not fear. Because you were so afraid of what might be taken away from us. For don't you understand, my dear friend, there is one thing that will never be taken away from us. Our salvation our hope of glory. And this is where we find our refuge, our strength, and our very present help. So we need to enter in. Behold the works of the Lord. Be still and know that he is God. And when you do so, you will be fearless. You won't be afraid of what man can do to you because you know your identity, your security, and your hope is not found in this world but it's found in the world to come. I know it's not an easy time, but I want you to know there is a refuge. There is a strength. There is a help that you can find your rest in. Come to him. Let's pray. This morning, what are you so afraid of? Can we just come before the Lord? You know, one of the things about being a kid, you always know that mom and dad are there. But when you're an adult, you feel that burden. You want your kids to feel safe and secure. But I want my kids to see that even as a parent, I have my fears too. I have my concerns. But I turn to my God as well to find my sense of security, strength, and protection. There's nothing wrong with that. We all have fears, my friends. Let's come and find our shelter in him today. Let's pray.
Father, this week you knew my heart. As I struggled to what I was going to preach on, because I needed a word of comfort. And all I could think about, Lord, was the glory that was to come. Because, Father God, is knowing that, God, that you are on that throne, that, God, I find comfort and peace. But because you're on that throne, as I've been reminded that, Lord, it causes me to live in a certain way, to live for you and your kingdom and your glory, to tell others about the saving knowledge of Christ, so that, God, that they will come to know where true refuge, strength, and help is found. God, I think I, take, find, I find great encouragement to hear that you are our fortress. What a picture. It's not just your house, a mansion, but you are our fortress. That no matter what may assail us, no matter what this world may bring to us, God, that we are safe in you indeed. And I pray that my friends here today would know that truth. God, that they could find their refuge in you. Because things will come that will destroy all our man-made refugees, refuges. We can only, God, we can only find our security in you. So, Father, I pray for those who are hurting, for those, Father God, who feel overwhelmed. Help them to behold your works, to be still, and know that you are God. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, would you rise as we sing today? announcements before we conclude today. Um, again, um, I want to remind you about our home groups. Um, we have a couple more weeks left, and so we would love to have you join us. And maybe this week will be good as we can come and just share our fears, come together and be vulnerable and real and to talk about our lives, to encourage us. And so 
I hope that you can join us. Um, again, we are online, that you can always find us in any way. So you can join any group you want. And so we would love to have you come and join us for that time. Children's Hunger Fund. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I think it's Thanksgiving. Next one. Uh, our next <laughs> Thanksgiving, obviously because of the PowerPoint. Um, our Thanksgiving service is coming up. Uh, it's going to be on November 22nd. Um, before Thanksgiving, and we would love to have you come and to celebrate and give thanks. We have so much to be get, thank, give thanks for. I know it's crazy, but God has given us health. God has given us life. God has given us YouTube. Um, there's to be thankful for, and we would love to have you join us. There's going to be a celebration. We're going to have a luncheon here at our second site. How that's going to look uh, is still in pro process, but we'll make sure that it's safe and clean. So we would love to have you come and join us uh, for that time. We had a great preview during our anniversary service. We all survived. No one got anything. So, so far, so good. But again, we don't trust ourselves. We put our trust in the Lord indeed. So please, uh, we'd love to have you join us uh, for that time. But again, we'll be a live stream at 1030 and then 130 we'll, we'll be um, in person as well. Also, we have our Children's Hunger Fund. Um, not only do we um, find God's goodness to us, we want, we want to share that goodness. And we would love to have you come and make a box for a homeless, uh, for people that are in need. And so if you like a box, let me know. I'll, I'll personally drop it off if I have to. Um, that's not a big deal for me. just want you to participate and to be a blessing to others. And again, for those who are here, um, if you um, can give us a box, it would be great. But we'll be collecting them on that Thanksgiving Sunday service on the 22nd. So please, if you can, it would be great indeed. But not only Thanksgiving, but we have Operation Christmas Child. Um, again, if you would like to make a, a box for a kid uh, with gifts, um, it would be wonderful as well. This is a time where you think about giving. And I hope that you would consider these things an opportunity to be a light, especially in this time of hardship indeed. So may God bless all of you no matter where you may be found. So can we all rise as we come before the Lord's presence and receive the Lord's benediction. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our sure foundation and our fortress, and the love of God our Father, who is almighty and all-powerful, who protects and provides because of his love, and the fellowship in the communion of the Holy Spirit that allows us to behold the works of the Lord, to be still and know that you are God. Be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen.